Awesome. Cool. So Mike asked me to talk about, um, uh, he, he called it breathing, but I asked about like holding your breath for a really long time and stuff like that. So um, I'll, I'll dip into a lot of different topics that are related. Um, we could also call this um, uh, cowboy meditation might be another way to, uh, to think about this a little bit. Um, and so there's a couple claims I want to make. Um, and this is the, the teaser. So uh, breathing gives us hacks to manipulate our, our, uh, our psychological state. So, you know, I'm sure everyone has experienced like trying to breathe calmly to like calm yourself down, lower cortisol or something like that. Um, there are therapeutic use cases. Um, we'll dip into this tomorrow. I think Robbie's doing a, a, a breathwork session uh, that can get pretty intense. Um, there's evidence that you can improve physical processes. And so uh, like your capacity, your endurance, these kinds of things, um, we, you can imp impact your autonomic nervous system directly. And we'll talk about what this is and why you might want to do that. And it's kind of cool. Um, I will admit that a lot of why I got into this is the, the last point. It just seemed kind of cool to play around with. Um, uh, I will note that I have zero idea the health risks. I know there's like weird things of, if you really push yourself hard, you can uh, get like ringing in the ears and stuff like this. I assume it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like high intensity interval training or um, like cold plunges or something like that. But like if you have heart conditions or something like that, like maybe maybe don't do this. I, I don't know. Um, and I'll also the other disclaimer I'm going to give is um, I have papers for some of this. Um, a lot of the claims that are made later have not been studied super, super well. Um, and so this is mostly through the lens of um, through experience instead of like uh, like bottom up, you know, um, and, and, you know, how, how we know things and that kind of stuff. So um, don't necessarily interpret all these things as uh, full fact or anything like that. Cool. We're going to do a speed run through some requisite concepts that might be useful later. Um, so you have uh, two types of nervous systems that are, that are operating, um, your, your somatic uh, nervous system and your autonomic nervous system. Um, you have experience with both of these. Um, so you're, you know, moving your body around or, um, you know, things automatically happening um, inside of you. Um, inside of your autonomic nervous system, there's the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And these can kind of be thought as states that are interesting. Um, and so uh, the, the sympathetic is, is often called the fight or flight, parasympathetic is rest and digest. Um, I'll note that neither of these is good or bad. You need both of these. So like if you existed in a parasympathetic, like really high parasympathetic state all the time, that would be bad. You wouldn't be able to respond to your environment and, and things like that. So um, yeah, noting that like none of these are good or bad and you're trying to like get rid of one or, or anything like that. Um, you also have brain networks. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but uh, so to, to overly simplify substructures that do things in your brain. Um, if you do brain scans, um, you should be able to uh, see them. So like this is a brain scan where things light up. You can also think about them as more um, like abstract entities that, you know, um, can be, you, you know, can be activated or not. Um, two examples of, of ne uh, networks that might be useful to think about. One is your salience network and the other is your default mode network. Um, to oversimplify a bit, your default mode is like when you're in a high default mode activation, um, you might be lost in thought, um, might have a larger sense of ego, um, these kinds of things. Salience is really uh, engaging with the outside world. And so, um, I'll make a couple claims. So let's see, cool. So um, different breathing, breathing in different ways allows direct manipulation of the sympathetic nervous system, um, which is kind of cool um, that, that you're, you're able to dip into this um, and be able to like, like be able to extract different implications by breathing in different ways. And so if you wanna Google these things, um, these three, seem to have um, pretty big uh, manipulation. And we'll talk about the last one um, uh, you know, later today. Um, and uh, in general, um, that's it, it's a cool technique, I guess, to have in your toolbox of uh, breathing in different ways does this. Now, you might ask like, why, why would this be true? And, and breathing is, is one of the things that 
exist both consciously and subconsciously, like you're breathing all the time. Um, you were breathing like 10 seconds ago and now you're manually breathing, right? And so um, because it bridges the, the gap, it seems plausible to me that, you know, it, it can, you can basically reach through it to interface the other side. Um, but I, I don't know the, the causal mechanisms here. Um, Another claim I'll make is systems need healthy stress in order to be resilient. And so if you've read like Black Swan or any of Taleb stuff, um, that probably resonates with you. Um, but this is where things like, like high intensity interval training or fasting or um, like experiencing a lot of different qualia. So, you know, experiencing all your emotions and things like that or cold, cold, cold exp exposure to me kind of checks out that it like it would be... Uh, it would make your system a lot more uh, stable. Um, and the last claim I'll make is day-to-day, uh, -day, most people's default mode network is super activated. Like they're, they're lost in thought all the time. Um, and uh, it, it can actually like get in the way of something that they're you know, wanting to accomplish. And the autonomic nervous system is highly engaged. And so um, this is something that, uh, yeah, that, that, that I think is true. It's true for a lot of people. Um, cool. Deep dive into oxygen versus carbon dioxide. So uh, there is a belief that if you breathe really heavily, you are increasing the O2 in your blood. It's not really true. Like if you, if you wear like a, a pulse ox on, on your finger, um, most people are sitting pretty saturated almost all the time. And so uh, you might be able to push it up one or 2% or something like that. But in general, like unless you're sick or, you know, something like that, your blood oxygen is pretty saturated. Um, your CO2 can vary wildly. Um, and you can, um, you can increase your CO2 by like not breathing um, or like working out really hard or, or something like that. Um, and it can be flushed out with heavy breathing. Um, things like the CO2 came from somewhere, like the O2 molecule came from something you were breathing. And so, um, Free divers think about this a lot. And so free divers made charts like this, um, where you can see that uh, your need to breathe is primarily influenced through high blood CO2 levels, not necessarily high O2 levels. I think it's true that you can't detect your O2 levels, but I know it's primarily driven by uh, CO2 levels. And so um, you'll notice here that like, that's the thing that's triggering someone like to really need to breathe. Um, and that need to breathe can be pretty intense. Um, you'll also see here, and I don't know how accurate this is, but um, through experience, you feel the need to breathe. You can go a really long time after that, um, especially if you're, you're comfortable with that feeling. Um, you're, you're like your diaphragm can start spazzing and these kinds of things, but you can like totally do it. Like you, you can pull this off. Uh, yeah. So you can, you can go a bit longer than uh, you think you can. Uh, and, and that can be, uh, I guess, improved with practice of just like getting comfortable um, with this feeling needing to breathe and actually like gets a lot easier where before what made you feel like dire, I really need to breathe, um, can actually be delayed quite a bit before you black out. And so, um, obviously that's probably not ideal going that far. Um, but yeah. Um, so we can think about the environments that you can put your body into as kind of like high O2, low O2, high CO2, low CO2. And there's two quadrants or two cells here that are, that are kind of interesting. Um, a high CO2, so it's your CO2 is building up, you have the need to breathe and you have low O2. Well, that's just the result of holding your breath. And, um, and so you can pretty easily trigger that. Um, if you wanted to create a low CO2, high O2 environment, um, you can do this through hyperventilation. So just breathing really, really heavy. Um, the other cells that I haven't highlighted here are just transitory. So like a, a low CO2, um, low O2, will uh, like very quickly change it and same for high CO2, high O2, um, because you know your, your, your lungs work uh, if they're working. Cool, so that's a lot of the requisite knowledge of uh, I guess nervous systems and O2 and how we might manipulate uh, things in the body. Um, I'll present a, uh, a guy named Wim Hof. Um, if you've heard of him, he is uh, often called the Iceman. He is wild. Uh, he has a bunch of records such as like climbing Everest without additional oxygen. And like he runs, he runs like barefoot on ice and, and sits in ice baths and stuff like that. Um, he makes a lot of very specific health claims that I have no clue if they're true or not. So if you get into what, what he is doing, um, 
be, be mindful of that. <laughs> like some of it's backed by science, some of it isn't. Um, a lot of it though, you can play with and get some sort of like orientation around uh, like what seems to work for you or not. Um, through experience, you can sit in very cold water for quite a while and be okay. Um, and that's something that you can definitely work up to and, you know, stress your body in different ways. Um, he has sat in ice water for like over an hour, dropping his core body temperature, I think below, it's like 85 degrees or something, and then was able to recover with no uh, negative side effects. Um, that's wild. Um, another thing he does is this uh, breathing protocol. So that's why we're here. Um, so if you're interested, he does other things. He also talks about like mindset stuff. It's, it's a, uh, he's a, He's a wild dude. So if you're interested in like digging into that, feel free to, uh, to, to Google him. And he's got like tons of YouTube videos and stuff like that. Um, okay, so his, his breathing protocol, his primary breathing protocol is actually pretty simple. So you hyperventilate, um, like you breathe really deeply. And what I mean by this is it's uh, primarily like a stomach breathing. So you're breathing the air basically as deep in your lungs as you can um, fairly quickly. And uh, you do this um, 30 to 40 times. Um, in like, if you use his app or something like that, he is primary, like it's to like a rhythm. So it's, you're not just like, you know, going crazy or, or anything like that. Um, and so you, you are lowering the CO2 in your blood, um, your O2, you know, will basically be at a hundred. Um, and then you hold your breath and um, this increases CO2 over time and will obviously decrease O2 as you are producing more and more CO2. Um, and this runs in several cycles. So I, I think like three or four times it is kind of normal. And so the whole thing, maybe 20, 30 minutes, something like that is like kind of the whole Wim Hof thing. Um, interestingly, um, as you go through this, you'll realize you'll be able to hold your breath longer and longer. And so you might start and get like a minute or minute and a half. And then, you know, on like the fourth cycle or something like that, um, go significantly longer than you thought was possible. So um, inside of this, um, there's the, the deep breaths, there is the retention and the recovery. Um, and I'm not actually sure what the role of the recovery breath is, but basically you're breathing um, pretty intensely for this 30, 40 times, you hold your breath. And then at the end of that, you do one like <gasps> more breathe in. And uh, it's uh, one interesting thing about this is like, so that while this whole thing sounds pretty awful, um, interesting stuff occurs. So during the deep breaths, if you participated in the uh, like holotropic style breath work uh, last time or tomorrow, um, you'll, you'll know kind of what the deep breaths can, can do. It's over time, you uh, get like very tingly, um, but it's, there's a, like your psychological state will most definitely change. And so um, there's almost like this stable euphoria that, that gets built. I do not know the cause or, you know, anything like that. Uh, during retention, anecdotally, it's as if the default mode network completely shuts off. It's like floating, peaceful, very serene. Um, if you're, if you practice enough, it can be almost like a, a loss of time where like two minutes passes and it really doesn't feel like two minutes passed, even though you're not breathing in something like that. Um, the recovery breath can be quite euphoric. And that's like oxygen, like re-entering the, the, the brain, um, like, you know, pretty, uh, pretty aggressively. And so um, maybe the role in, in his uh, system is just the euphoria, like why he does it. Um, but uh, that's kind of the, the cycle that occurs. Um, why might you do this? Because if it, if it sounds awful or it sounds uh, like kind of stressful or anything like that. So uh, physiologically increasing tolerance to CO2, it's kind of just nice in general. Like uh, um, I realized after doing this without any explicit extra cardio exercise and things like that, I could basically output more than other people that were not doing something like this. And I think it's just getting your body comfortable with you know, these, these higher CO2 environments and be able to purge the CO2 and that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's most likely a cardiovascular stressor. Um, and this might be good. I have no clue. Um, certainly it, uh, it, it is, uh, it feels wild. Um, and there's, there's anecdotes, there's, uh, there's people claiming it helps with performance optimization. One interesting thing Wim Hof does is you, uh, will do a breath hold and then do like a ton of pushups and anecdotally, you can do way more pushups than you normally can. And so I don't exactly know what's, what's occurring, but like, that's why physiologically you might be interested in it. Um, 
I mentioned before that like breath has this ability to impact, uh, you know, your uh, almost like subconscious nervous system and be able to uh, change things that no normally you can't otherwise change. And so uh, there's also a psychological impact to this. Um, I find it as a really cool stoic exercise of like, you know, sometimes you have these uh, um, pretty contained uh, bits of suffering and you just recognize that it's actually not that bad. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if that's interesting to anyone else, um, but during the process of uh, default mode network is um, anecdotally, like, you know, it very much feels to me very much deactivated. And like, if you go through it, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, it very much feels like a reset. And so like, I would equate it to, um, you know, like any kind of like kind of deep meditation or something like that, where afterwards it kind of just feels like the stress from before it, it passed away. So it can be an interesting tool there. Um, and I just think it's, it's kind of cool. So that's why psychologically, I think it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, so I'm sure everyone's wondering how long can I hold my breath? Uh, my record um, was actually here. So this is at elevation um, was just over four minutes, 30 seconds um, during retention. And um, in that I was not blacking out. Uh, and so I have blacked out before at a lower elevation at around four minutes. And so, um, yeah, um, and, and usually like you, you know as you're going, so it's not like something that just like hits you or, or something like that. Um, but uh, I do not do this all the time. It's something that I've, I've experimented with and play with. And it's kind of like on my shelf of things like you to reduce stress and, and that kind of thing. So. Um, that's mostly it. If you're interested in any of this, uh, Wim Hof has an app where it's like, it, it makes it really easy to do like the breathing and like you, you can tap the screen and you just don't have to worry about that. Um, there's YouTube videos that walk you through. He has a book I'm sure in there is a lot of dubious health claims. And so, uh, I guess, uh, be mindful of that. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting read. Um, tomorrow there is a breathwork exercise and it is, um, you know, resonate with a lot of these topics. So he might mention very similar things about nervous system activation and, and that sort of thing. Um, and his is slightly different than this protocol, um, but the, the outcome is, is decently similar if he's going to do what he did last time. Um, and I have collected, if you're interested in some of the science of this, of like people doing brain scans during these, uh, these kind of like crazy breathing and stuff like that, uh, let me know. I can send you links. Um, but as I mentioned, it's, not massively studied. And so like the, the, the causal mechanism behind a lot of these claims are, uh, is a little bit spotty at best. Um, I'm happy to send them. Let me grab them. I can send them in the chat um, and maybe include this later. So uh, that's, that's most of it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there's a book uh, that's about breathing and how you are over breathing and you need to breathe more slowly and things like that. So it's a definitely a rabbit trail that you can, um, go down and uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. It, it seems like there's more fruit than you'd otherwise expect by manipulating your breath. So um, that's mostly it. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or you know, open up discussion if anyone has. Um, yeah, yeah, rabbit hole that ends up in mere, weird mouth taping, yeah. So um, yeah, you have to be a little bit down with some, with some strange behaviors. If, <laughs> so yeah. Um, well, cool. Yeah. Any, any questions or any, anything anyone wants to chat about? How long did it take you to get to four minutes? Um, My question. A couple months. Um, I was, so for a while I did it every day and you could almost see certainly week over week, pretty big improvements. And I think some of that is uh, physiological. Like I'm sure my body is adapting. Um, and some of it is just like, like psychological of like, the first time you experience your diaphragm spazzing, like that's kind of a, like elicits a panic response for a lot of people. Um, and then once you realize like, oh, it's like merely just a muscle spazzing, I'm fine. And like, you can go, like, you know, for a fact, you can go like another minute, then it like, it's not that big of a deal. And so I think like both are improving. I don't know the combination between the two, like what's physiological. I do know I took like a six month break and then came back and I was able to knock out like three minutes, 45 seconds without any like, without trying or anything like that. Um, so yeah. That's cool, so it's pretty durable. I think so, like at least the psychological side and maybe it's just like more of like a YOLO kind of thing of like recognizing you can do it and so you're just like pushing through it, so yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have like a similar question, Andrew. Um, might be hard to measure like you just said, but I know uh, like 
you're, you're a big rock climber, live a active lifestyle. Like since adopting this, I guess it's hard to say tangibly, but have you noticed like, um, like anything like endurance wise in particular with, with, with like the breath work practice stuff? I'm just curious. Yeah, it's really hard to isolate the variables. Um, and so I, I think like Taylor mentioned, it could be similar to training at higher altitude. So like when you do something like this, your, your body is making adaptations to a higher CO2, lower O2 environment. And so it wouldn't surprise me at all. It's just like really hard to separate out like causal mechanisms. Like I got really into mountain biking last year and mountain bike a ton. And so like, obviously like my VO2 max was like improved that way. And you know, just like cardio was improved that way. And so I have no clue. It seems plausible to me, like totally, totally seems plausible, but I think it's something that someone should do because they think it sounds fun. Then, <laughs> Yeah. I was going to ask one. Um, did you find when you're cycling through the reps for Wim Hof that you were able to hold your breath longer and longer each time? Yeah. Yeah. And, and most people it's like this. So uh, the first time, and I'm not sure what the, it must be psychological of just like recognizing you can do it. But my longest breath holds are after several, like several cycles previously. Yeah, I found, I found the same. And I was just wondering if there was any science or anything behind that. I mean, there's a chance that each additional purge of CO2 is actually purging more and more. So it's as if you did like 50 or 60 breaths. Um, like that's plausible to me, but it could just also be a psychological of like being in like a more rested state. Like something I've noticed is um, if you ever try to do breath holds while doing any kind of physical activity, you'll realize you only can hold your breath for like 20 or 30 seconds. Like there's a exercise where you hold your breath and you just take slow, deliberate steps forward. And you really can't do it that long. You know, like, you know, I think like 50 steps is, is quite good of being able to do, which is significantly less than a minute. And so like another aspect could also just be a higher relaxation state where through further cycles, your body is just a lot more relaxed. And so your, your muscles are less activated. And so you're producing less CO2 to begin with, but I don't know. Interesting. I, I, it was remarkable how much it went up over time. So yeah. On the note about it being psychological, I just have to share that when I was like, nine or 10, uh, we would do like breath holding competitions at our local swim club. And I was by far the worst. Like I could do like 20 seconds. It was like a thing that was talked about. Like I couldn't hold my breath. And I had a dream one night that was really vivid that I was a fish that I could hold my breath underwater. And I woke up so completely convinced that I could hold my breath underwater that I ran to the swim club immediately at 9 a.m got in the water and held my breath for like three and a half minutes. <laughs> and it yeah. just, it stayed like that. And like it wore off over the course of a week once I like came back down to earth, but it was a crazy experience. Um, one question though, I have had, I've tried this a couple of times that like fast breathing and I've had terrible experiences. Like I get the tingling, but then I also get this like generalized physiological anxiety and just discomfort. And I need to yeah. stop immediately. I don't know. Is that common? I don't know. I know what Robbie tomorrow will probably would probably think of this and you can ask him. Um, but I would assume with the reduction of default mode network, any kind of background anxiety you have bubbles up. And the reason I mention this is um, in like, there's a form of breath work called holotropic breath work, where you basically do heavy breathing for a very long time, like uh, 30 minutes, an hour or something like that. And you very much like people will like hallucinate and stuff like that. And it becomes like incredibly therapeutic of like people like dealing with grief and trauma and that kind of thing. And so I would imagine this is like a, like a microdose of that. Um, that's what he would say. I have no evidence for any of that. So like, I, I don't know. Yeah. I had a feeling he would say it. it's just so physical. Like it was, it didn't feel psychological at all. It was just like my body being like, not good. Stop. Like you're getting yeah. dizzy and like, I don't know. You might be able to like dip your toes into it. And also it could just be not for you. Like, uh, you know, I, I assume that this is going to resonate. Like, for example, I love cold plunges. Um, there is no amount of money you could pay my wife to get into cold water. And so
through how long is a typical breath hold session for you or um, breath work session either? Um, for this, I guess it's 20 to 30 minutes, like 25 minutes. I'm just multiplying out. Um, I usually, I've used the app before. And so it's like uh, 30 or 40, they have a setting um, of like deep breaths. And so that only takes, you know, a minute or two and then a retention. And so that's just up to you how, how long you can retain. And then like three or four of those. And so something like that, um, you can certainly do it a lot faster though. Like you'll, you'll get into a groove where like everything becomes significantly easier. And so it's almost like the, the beginning definitely is not fun. Like breathing heavy for a long time is not fun in any respect. And so almost like there's like a price to start getting into it. Um, and then, yeah, Jeremy sh shared a other ship. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure. What's your typical posture too? Do you lay down or do you sit up? I know Wim Hof sort of recommends like whatever's comfortable. Yeah, I've done both. Um, I actually find it hard to get really good belly breathing if, if I'm laying down, like it's almost like there's more resistance. And so I prefer to sit up and, um, and, and also the, the breathing technique he has, there's YouTube videos, um, was uh, a bit of an adjustment for me because it's, I guess I, I was used to more like chest breathing. And so, um, yeah, to kind of like focusing on pulling it, the air as low as you can into your lungs. Sweet. Any other thoughts, comments, challenges? This is awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate it. Nice. Cool. This is awesome. Thanks. See ya.